Hello, good evening everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all staff and students who have joined um, the IOPPN at Twilight Lecture Series today. Please note that we will be recording this meeting. My great pleasure this evening is to introduce Professor Janet Treasure, who's been a long-standing colleague of mine, and her lecture on the rising tide of eating disorders. Let me just introduce Janet Treasure to you. Janet Treasure has specialised in the treatment of eating disorders at the Maudsley and has spent uh, her long and fruitful academic career at, the, at King's. She was made a professor of psychiatry in 2000 and she and her team have co-produced interventions with recovered patients and carers using some of the newest technologies, including iPads, DVDs and web-based interventions. In 2013, she was given an OBE for her work in eating disorders. In a minute, Professor Treasure will be presenting her slides and we will then have a Q&A session. Please submit your questions via the live event Q&A. Please do upvote questions as we will read out the questions with the most votes. OK, over to Janet now. Right, so let's get back to this first slide and I want to explain a little bit about it. So Anthony Gormley was a neighbour of mine uh, in Peckham, so it brings us locally to this area. But what I particularly like about this picture is one that he did of a series of Inside Australia and he took men who'd been working in mines and Took, I don't know how he did it, took pictures of their form and then shrank them down. And of course, this made me very much think about anorexia nervosa. And what is also marvellous about this installation is that it's one on one of the pink sand lakes that you see in South Australia. And I'm going to be talking about the isolation of eating disorders later on and I think this image really captures that. But then underneath we get this rising tide, this surf coming over us and those of us working in eating disorder clinics of the moment almost feel as though we are bombarded after Covid with this rising tide of more, more and more severe problems. So I'm going to be talking about historical landmarks and guys and the Institute have had quite a long history in this. Um, so although anorexia was described in the 15th century, it was Sir William Gull who worked at guys, of course, who uh, gave it its name and encouraged having meetings talking about this illness and gave it its name, anorexia nervosa. Then the next person who was very involved in this was Ryle, who again was at Guy's and wrote a case series of over 50 cases of anorexia nervosa. But the next milestone was in 1979 with Gerald Russell, who you can see here in a characteristic being on um, a conference pose because he had his camera with him and he had such delight in taking pictures of art galleries. So it's it sort of just sums him up for me. So I, that's why I love this picture. But he gave a big advance to our field as in 1979 he wrote up the first case series of people with bulimia nervosa. He wrote up 30 cases. He considered this to be an ominous course uh, of anorexia nervosa, that some people went on to this phase where they had binge eating and, and compensated for that by vomiting and purging. The later stages, uh, the changes that we've had uh, with DSM-5, where we've had binge eating disorder introduced and many other eating disorders. So these diagnostic categories have been changing over time. So we have anorexia nervosa, the 1873, bulimia nervosa, 1979. 
And then with the DSM-5, we have, uh, as I've already said, binge eating disorder, but several other disorders that were more used in childhood. Uh, so avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, PICA, rumination and other feeding and eating disorders. And these newer diagnoses will be in our in the new ICD uh, diagnostic uh, manual. And you can see from this slide here how eating disorders have been increasing over these last decades. Uh, so in the gr green at the bottom, we have anorexia, which is the lowest incidence and prevalence and has remained pretty steady. But we initially got that increase in bulimia and then more recently we've had an increase in bed. Of course, uh, these increases are part related because there now is an awareness, a label, so people can go for help, uh, realising that perhaps there might be some help available. So what we're finding is a big change in what eating disorders are. There was a stereotype that uh, it was related to thin, white, middle class girls. Whereas a recent community study uh, done in Camberwell uh, showed in fact that there was wide diversity. Uh, that black and Asians had higher levels than the white population and that the highest levels were, were in people who are overweight. So these stereotypes have changed in the community. So there are special issues for men with eating disorders uh, and this has been called reverse anorexia nervosa because for some of them, rather than a drive for thinness, there's more of a drive for muscularity. And sometimes this has been called bigorexia, and that involves eating differently to bulk up or androgenic anabolic steroid use. In men, exercise is more of a clinical feature, and one of the physical complications is quite severe bradycardia. Males are more increased in children and in people with binge eating disorder. Um, so we get about a third of the population in these specific subgroups that are males, whereas in anorexia in the normal uh, you know, population from 10 to 25, it's one in 10 uh, males. And you may have um, seen recent press reports. Uh, Freddie Flinders talked about this and we're seeing that some of the images and the idea that social media have a, a big influence of eating disorder being converted for males and so we're now having a lot of experimental sh studies show exposing men to uh, idealised images and seeing how that impacts on them. So aside from the new subtypes that have been added uh, into the DSM-5, we have quite an alphabetical soup of new potential disorders. The wordsmiths in the press really seem to love this and, and produce a variety of interesting uh, new names. So we've got anorexia athletica, the idea uh, as discussed in males, that a lot of athletes, they have a higher risk of eating disorder. Anorexia by proxy, where sometimes children are affected Diabulimia, I'm going to be talking about more. Drunkorexia, where people alter the, their patterns of eating uh, and only have alcohol. Food addiction, orthorexia, picking eating and purging. So diabulimia uh, was 
entitled the most dangerous eating disorder in a recent television program and you can see the the link to that which C professor Khalida Ishmael uh, had a great role in um, organizing and helping with and indeed the diabetic department at King's and Kalida are very much working in this area uh, trying to develop new treatments uh, and so why this is important is because there's a great increased prevalence two to three times uh, the risk of getting an eating disorder in the diabetic type 1 population. And it takes a, a rather different form uh, as classical eating disorders in that insulin emission is used as a, a weight loss strategy. So it seems so obvious, you know, if you don't prick yourself and uh, give the insulin, you'll lose glucose in your urine. And of course, though, that this has a big downside of increased risk admissions with ketoacidosis and complications. Some of the newer uh, disorders that are perhaps going to be in the next uh, manuals of diagnosis. Uh, one of these is orthorexia, where some people, you know, very much divide food on moral grounds with good and bad healthy eating. Uh, and so we'll only eat sort of fresh foods and foods that aren't cooked, etc, etc. So we've seen this great change in the form of eating disorder and in the epidemiology. And so obviously there's not changes in the genes, so cultural factors uh, must be involved in contributing to this. And there's been various hypotheses uh, and thoughts about this. And Naomi Wolf is one of the uh, thinkers that uh, has put her mind to this and she very much considered that perhaps eating concerns have now replaced sexual concerns in the 20th and 21st century so Freud uh, many of his cases had these sexual worries but that these eating worries are much more generalized now in society uh, and People are now becoming very aware of weight stigmatization with this rising increase in obesity. There's also at the same time uh, this severe weight stigmatization throughout society. And this is a social injustice and also a public health issue because it by stigmatizing weight, it in fact people exposed to such uh, messages tend to eat as an emotional regulation pattern and so rather than helping prevent obesity it worsens it and of course in fact doctors are perhaps big culprits in this as this cartoon shows you know doctor I've been impaled well, the doctor saying, well, maybe you'll feel better if you lose some weight. And perhaps that's a, a common cry that some of our patients uh, say they hear. And, but there's becoming more of a movement uh, about uh, developing uh, strategies to reduce the stigma of obesity. Then Another big change that we've had that might be responsible for eating disorders is the changes in food technology. So we've been having great changes in what we eat and how we eat it. Uh, fast food eaten on the move rather than uh, classically prepared and cooked meals that are eaten socially. And it's, it is thought that some of these things might hook us into a pattern of more addictive eating. And there's been quite a lot of research into this area. So a, 
a great deal of research has used animal models and we can get animals to binge eat uh, if we produce a lot of the environmental factors that seem to be relevant in humans. So certain genotypes seem to be at more risk, but also the food type and patterning. So if you give cookies, I mean biscuits, sort of high sugar fat food, but give it intermittently, give it on a Monday, Wednesday and Thursday, that in combination with some food restraint as well, that tends to lead to this binge pattern of eating. And particularly if you combine it with some sort of stress as well. So uh, we can see that some of these cultural things we've been discussing uh, might be important. And there's been great changes in uh, the types of food we eat. So food technology has been used to increase palatability by using flavours uh, that can mimic protein, for example, in crisps. So you can have chicken flavoured crisps, etc., that trick the body. Also, there are combinations of essences of food that give us pleasure uh, in artificial combinations. So combinations of fat, sweet and sometimes salt, you know, um, salted caramel chocolate, for example, is perhaps a, a big culprit. Um, and of course, these activate our dopamine systems quite highly. And then, of course, food is much more accessible and low in cost. And it's thought that these aspects uh, might uh, predispose to food addiction. And then, of course, we have the diet industry uh, where by promoting a thinness ideal and weight stigma do tend to stabilize, unstabilize people's uh, eating pattern and leading to dieting and not dieting, etc. And we know that general adversity uh, also increases this. So these factors may account for, for the increase in food addiction, which is very high in, in bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. So let's move from these cultural factors to look at the predisposing biology. Now, anorexia nervosa is quite an enigma uh, because, uh, for instance, starvation, which is usually highly aversive uh, and leads to lethargy, uh, people feeling depressed and unwell. We don't get that in people with eating disorder. In contrast, they're often restless, exercise a lot, and a La Serga psychiatrist in France sort of noted that they said, I do not suffer, therefore I'm well. They don't feel unwell. Um, so that's very unusual. Some ev evolutionary hypotheses suggest that maybe in some people this is an adaptation to increased foraging behaviour, perhaps. What we find is that even in this starvation state, high palatability, high pal palatability of foods, those with high calories, seem to be less rewarding and less wanted uh, and produce uh, less uh, brain changes as we'd usually expect in anticipation. But we also have an animal model whereby we can get activity being more reinforcing than food. So this is a model where we have animals that are restricted in their eating to only certain times a day, but they also have a running wheel in their cage. 
And what happens with some of these animals, it's particular genotypes, it's particularly happens in females, that they choose to run on the wheel rather than eat the food that is there. And so this is being used as a, a model to perhaps develop new treatments for anorexia nervosa because it, it does seem to echo some of this paradoxical response that we see in our patients. So there is a genetic susceptibility and these are two identical twins um, that unfortunately both had anorexia. And I, I did a twin study with my colleague Tony Holland uh, in the 80s and it, people were very amazed that we're doing such a thing. I almost felt I was going to get eggs thrown at me when I was talking about this in conferences because there was very much a feeling that these illnesses were all cultural and that any genetic factors uh, were unrealistic. But what we found when we did this study that over 50% up to 88% uh, heritability in concordance and we also find in first degree relatives and an 11 fold risk. Similarly, in case register linkage studies, we get an increased risk and we're seeing this when we do uh, the new GWAS studies too. So let's turn to some of the results that we're getting from these GWAS studies. And this study here, uh, led by Watson and Cindy Bulick and Jerome Breen from the Institute of Psychiatry here, uh, what is the largest so far. It's about 17,000 cases of anorexia nervosa. And the most easily absorbable and interesting results from this result from the polygenic scores which show correlations between the cluster of genes that are associated most associated with anorexia cases and those that are associated with other forms of illness. So the highest correlation uh, in these clusters of genes are with those with people with obsessive compulsive disorder. And this is not at all surprising to us because clinically we see a lot of similarities. And this uh, image by Elise, somebody who had an eating disorder and then and also did uh, fine arts, has produced these images for us for our books. Uh, you can see how perfectionism is quite a common trait. Uh, so this person feels that they've only just passed when they've got 100% and A stars. And what we see before the onset of the illness is obsessive compulsive traits in childhood. Uh, uh, and perfectionism. We also see habits and concern over mistakes and we also see when we're looking at more experimental medicine procedures, uh, difficulty set, sh set shifting, rigidity, a focus on detail and when we do scanning studies we show that thalamocortical circuits are disrupted. Also, we do see that these traits run in families uh, at a higher level. And when we look at the endophenotype in families, again, we see this rigidity and detailed focus. And after recovery, we again, the obsessionality is still there and some of these traits are still there. So these all fit in with a, a, a genetic uh, vulnerability to these sort of traits and this sort of personality style. Then the next cor correlation uh, is with uh, anxiety, depression and neuroticism. And again, that is not surprising because we do see again a lot of comorbidity with anxiety 
and neuroticism in our clinical patients. So as this image shows, people aren't just full of food, they have all these negative emotions uh, that uh, fill their stomach space. And so our work has shown that anxiety is very common in childhood, various forms of anxiety. We are, when we look at the endophenotype, the fear phenotype, we see that uh, the, the ability to extinguish fears is reduced and fears come back after extinction more quickly. So there might be something in the fear control mechanism uh, that's impacted. We do see depression and anxiety higher in families and depression and anxiety uh, remain after recovery. So this very much fits again with a genetic vulnerability. Another positive correlation uh, is with exercise um, and wanting to be on the go all the time. And again, uh, there are various clinical features that indicate that this is linked. Uh, I've talked about the animal model uh, where there's preference for exercise over food. And we do see that in childhood, uh, people who go on to develop anorexia nervosa often seem to have increased activity above the norm. Uh, and uh, clinically, this restlessness and feeling well sort of is a classical phenotype that is very much a paradox. And uh, recent studies have shown that siblings uh, also show different emotional patterns to a standard bout of exercise. So they get more positive emotions as do the patients with eating disorder. And people after recovery have increased activity. But what was surprising is that not that do we not get just get correlations with these brain related traits. But we also showed correlations uh, with metabolic syndrome traits, but negative correlations here. So we're getting insulin sensitivity, we're getting high levels of high density cholesterol and low levels of low density cholesterol for example, and also we're getting uh, negative correlations with BMI and growth traits. Now, yet again, this very much maps on to the clinical picture, to the appetite and growth phenotype. And again, Elisa's image very nicely shows how gut and brain, we know more and more how related they are with the microbiome now, um, and how this relationship seems to get totally disrupted in people with anorexia nervosa. So in childhood, there's a tendency for leanness, smaller birth weight, having feeding problems and picky eating, uh, the endophenotype shows both structural and functional anomalies in the areas of the brain that are associated with reward and feeding, the orbital frontal cortex, striatum and insula. I've already talked about the increased risk in families and after recovery from anorexia, there tends to be persistent leanness uh, and when people have looked at their response to food images and response to taste stimulants, we still see abnormalities in appetite systems uh, in people who've recovered. So um, to summarise, these latest studies very much endorse what we found in our other 
clinical and experimental medicine uh, studies. So that there are many of the, we know that the, the many of these predisposing risk traits fulfilling the criteria for an endophenotype. And so it follows that new treatments that target these uh, could be developed and indeed have been started to be developed. Um, uh, and so that that is work in place. What we don't know, however, is the GWAS study, the genetics for binge eating disorder and believing in nervosa yet. Uh, however, this uh, this year, this study led by Jerome uh, Bream uh, Edgy is remedying that in that we're now encouraging all forms of eating disorder to donate their saliva so that we can do a GWAS study on and find out more about the risks for these forms of eating disorder. And we can probably uh, make gambling guesses on whether we'll see similar underlying genetic susceptibility or differences. Um, there has been a tendency to regard, put eating disorders all together and talk about transdiagnostic features. However, some features of eating disorders are not transdiagnostic, they're very separate. Um, and that is the appetite response. So I've already talked about uh, the idea that there's increased responsivity to satiety in anorexia nervosa. But when we look in cases who go on later to have bulimia nervosa uh, and binge eating disorder, we see the opposite pattern. So we see increased birth weight we see overweight in childhood and childhood overeating. So we can imagine that we're going to see a very different metabolic profile in, in our patients uh, from the GWAS study in these disorders. So we always want to know what uh, un increased understanding means for outcome and treatment. And at the moment, uh, we do have a problem in that treatments are not brilliant. Uh, for instance, in anorexia nervosa, uh, studies have shown that only a third are recovered by 10 years of illness. And anorexia nervosa, uh, we have get high levels of severity which require inpatient treatment. This picture here shows uh, inpatient stays for anorexia nervosa from the 1960s uh, to 2010 and you can see these rapid changes in the last 10 decades of increasing admissions. Uh, and anorexia nervosa has the longest admissions of any psychiatric disorder and also it has the highest mortality of any psychiatric disorder. So what do patients describe uh, about their illness? Well, they describe stress and social isolation it's coming to that gormley image. Uh, here's an image by Elise again showing her portrayal of what anorexia is like. It shows her in an ice cube, the rest of the world warm and happy, her herself frozen away, unable to talk with these cold blue hands. Uh, and a very interesting personal journey in the BMJ of an an individual who had anorexia when in her early adolescence, later qualified as a doctor, uh, but said if there was one word to describe anorexia, it would be isolation. And Elise has drawn 
what happens over time, what happens over these 10 or 20 years uh, when people experience the illness. And this is very much like a snowball metaphor. We get the eating disorder going down the hill, getting bigger and bigger, getting more complicated, more depression, more anxiety, more rules and rituals and habits getting very ingrained in. Uh, and this little video by talk by a patient just gives her I, for a long time, I had this, like, this, I would always say, like, nobody understands me, so nobody can really help me. Um, and then somebody asked me, a therapist asked me, well, do you really understand yourself? And I said, I guess not. She said, so, it's so this difficulty that people with eating disorders have in understanding and we've had in understanding, Perhaps we're getting to a stage where we can better understand and formulate the problem. So I've summarised here some of the things that I've talked about that we have seen seem to be related to anorexia nervosa. So the, the white areas are those that are predisposing factors that we might be able to target, for example. Um, so the obsessive compulsive traits and indeed my colleague uh, Kate Chanchoria has developed treatments that involve cognitive remediation to try and moderate some of this extreme perfectionism and to increase flexibility and ability to see the big picture. Then we have the anxiety traits and we're using new techniques to try and overcome uh, the anxiety that food and eating and the idea that you'll become fatter and you might gain weight and you might be socially rejected. That's that's more of the fear in most of our patients with anorexia nervosa and have uh, and we're using new techniques such as um, uh, virtual reality to target these. Then we have problems in social functioning and we're again uh, able to uh, produce some targeted treatments that affect these. Exercise and nutrition, they're very much have been always part of treatment for eating disorders, um, but we're very aware that we need to uh, impact on these as early as possible in the disorder before we get them very embedded in. So these are the predisposing traits that we've seen are probably genetic re related, but then what gets very complicated in eating disorders is the secondary consequences that um, going the snowball of increasing problems. Uh, part of these are interpersonal reactions and part of these are the consequences uh, to the individual of uh, severe stress and starvation in terms of neuroprogression and neuroadaptation to this very unusual state. So I've been particularly interested in some of my work in perhaps targeting these social factors um, and recognising that it's very easy to be drawn into a trap uh, by one's instinctive reactions to seeing somebody with anorexia nervosa that can inadvertently maintain the problem. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a tendency to get very overprotective, what we call kangaroo care. And as you see from this image by Elise, not only are you protecting uh, the child you love, but the anorexic voice mindset is still there and might get protected uh, too. And we do see that carers and and that is lay carers, uh, parents, 
uh, friends, etc., accommodate to the illness. Um, uh, and this can keep the the disorder going. And then the, the opposite type of uh, impact is to be what we call rhino care, where you have head to head conflict, uh, sort of criticism and hostility. Uh, but that can just feel as lacking in warmth and protection and just encourages the anorexic voice and anorexic mindset to rebel. We've also talked about weight stigma and how there can be a lot of blame and shame and, and depression related to that. And we get abnormalities from the individual because of starvation uh, in that their social cognition becomes impacted. Most of our brains are set up as humans to be social animals. And so if we reduce our energy supply, this system gets affected. And it leads to aloofness, lack of social expression, and a loss of social reciprocity, which very much uh, leads to the alienation, the isolation that was described as a sort of core problem of this illness. And uh, this image of the elephants all working together was given by a carer saying that that's how she experienced what was needed in anorexia help in that professionals and families needed to be closely collaborating to avoid getting into splits within these interpersonal reactions. I must admit it was quite astonishing to have this elephant metaphor to be added to our kangaroo and rhino metaphors. But we've known for a long time, uh, Gerald Russell did a wonderful study that family based therapy for young people, young children and adolescents uh, has a better outcome than say individual therapy. Uh, and so involving the parents, getting them helping uh, eating is very important. But we've been doing a lot of work with a slightly different approach because the getting the parents to take total charge of a meal is not necessarily uh, workable for, for young adults. Uh, and so we have to give more different advice to those parents and supporters of ways in which they can help the individual manage the eating and uh, overcome some of the difficulties. And we have found that these skill sharing approaches uh, and educational approaches can reduce length of stay and relapse in these older patients uh, with uh, persistent anorexia nervosa. Uh, and so we've been very much thinking of how we can uh, use methods of increasing support in different ways. And one of the ways that we've done this uh, has been to get recovery stories from people with an eating disorder in order to help others. And this is one of them. The other thing I think is really important to remember as you go through recovery is it, it isn't just about you. Mm. People can only change themselves, but but I needed the people around me to change with me. Like I go back to work and and everyone expects you to be the person with anorexia. Mm. So the biscuits go round, you get avoided, you don't get invited to lunch, mm. people look you up and down, and you almost feel duty bound to fulfil that role. Mm. <clears throat> and, and guilty if you don't. So, whereas you've got plans to do something different, mm. nobody around you allow you because that's your identity. So I, I would have liked, believe it or not, when I went back to work, people to offer me biscuits, even if I couldn't do it. 
Mm. Just not them to to expect me to have anorexia. And in the end, I, I gave up a job I loved because I needed a new role so mm. I could have a new identity. And it works because now now I can be what I want to be. Mm. Whereas amongst my friends, people would still say, well done for eating. Mm. I feel like, don't say, well done. I just want to be normal. Mm. So this is an example of how we've tried to get extra social factors to encourage recovery. And we're also, as Ulrika said, using apps for treatment that's particularly been involved in treatments for bulimic disorders uh, and these are, are being tested. And for these treatment resistant cases of anorexia nervosa after lasting so long, we are, and Ulrika Schmidt has been pioneering this area, using neuromodulation techniques um, in order to help the eating disorder. And the interesting thing what we find is that we get changes in depression initially, and that might be the first effect, and the changes in eating and the, the eating disorder symptoms take may, may take a, a year to develop. But this this is a, a really interesting new approach and similarly people are thinking looking over their shoulder at their colleagues in treatment resistant other disorders and depression in particularly and thinking of using psychedelics and ketamine and we're also using it solutions to try to help um, with this very um difficult uh, problem in our patients. So to conclude, uh, what I've hoped to have shown you that there's been this rapid increase in new forms of eating disorders in cohorts born, born after 1950. I have talked about the environmental factors that may have contributed this, weight stigma, the objectification of the body, changes in eating style and food technology. But we've also seen that there are a lot of biological underpinnings, uh, so both brain and metabolic genetic risk factors seem to be there. So this is very much a, a psychosomatic illness, um, which explains, you know, how gull and ryle had it in medical settings and it's only recently moved to psychiatry. Uh, and, but there are these anomalies in reward and emotional management and social cognition that perhaps we in psychiatry are best placed, psychiatry psychology are best placed to handle. Uh, so treatment uh, Augmenting social support can be helpful, mood management and tackling anxiety and some of these other traits uh, can be very useful approaches. Uh, and so the outcome, we really are at an exciting time because we are understanding these disorders and there's a lot of potential for improvement. So I want to sort of thank many of the people who've been involved in some of these studies. So there's Ulrika there who's chairing this and Kate Chanchuria, a psychologist. But uh, there's a, the picture to the left is the parents uh, and carers who, uh, carers and patients with eating disorders with lived experience who've all been involved in uh, treatments, the ward, and of course all the students looking at the uh, experimental medicine underpinnings of these disorders. So thank you very much and we're open to taking questions. Thank you very, very much, oh, uh, Janet. And um, 
what a lovely note on which to finish all the wonderful people that have been involved in your work and a great tour de force of a lecture. So let's look at the questions. And Hannah, who is boss, has said, because there was a bit of faffing about at the beginning, we can go very slightly over and have 10 minutes for questions because there are quite a few. So the first one here is, where do we draw the line between diets, e.g. keto or paleo diets or intermittent fasting to induce ketosis versus having an eating disorder, given that so many subtypes have been introduced and people can easily fit into any category. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a very interesting question and maybe this can be added to the alphabet. As we, as we see, food and these various forms of uh, wanting to remediate and control food and eating are, are very common and very variable. So I don't know, perhaps you'd need to make a special name for that I, uh, and we could add it to the list. But uh, you perhaps know more about it than I do, I'm afraid. OK, good. Next question. What are your views on using calorie labels on foods as interventions to reduce or prevent obesity? Yeah, I think that's uh, an issue that BEAT and, and the government are, are very much thinking about because there's, there's, there is a bit of a problem that some of the things to manage obesity uh, do seem to be having untoward effects on people with eating disorders. We often see, for instance, um, a healthy food lecture seems to trigger an eating disorder in an, a younger person. Um, and yet we know that in fact there are several many uh, primary prevention things that would be common to eating disorders and obesity. So tackling weight stigma for a, for a start would do that. Uh, and so this is an area that's quite hot at the moment uh, and in debate. I know Jerome uh, is involved in discussions with the government sort of trying to get more information about it. But, uh, but I think it's, it's not fully clear, but is is very interesting area. So thank you for bringing it up. Where do you think the field of eating disorders will go over the next 20 to 30 years? Oh. Well, I think, as I say, I think you know, we do have so much greater understanding and knowing that we really do have to act in as soon as possible. But that's difficult because of this idea that the person, the patient doesn't feel ill does mean that it can take a while before they present for treatment. But we in our treatments must make sure that we're uh, hot off the press and Ulrika is uh, pioneering Freed, which is a way to get as early as possible intervention for adults. And we know that for children, there has been investment to get them seen very quickly uh, after the first symptoms, after they first present for treatment. So there is luckily increased resource um, to sort of help these pathways run uh, much more quickly. Okay. Next question. Do you think that the government strategy to focus on weight loss throughout the pandemic um, could lead to a rise in eating disorders? And the questioner said, I noticed a big TV advertising push especially given the anxiety that some people might feel about catching COVID-19. Yeah, well, there's no doubt that all the studies on cohorts that have had bulimia nervosa and binge eating in the past and have been followed or cohorts of patients in treatment, that the bulimic symptoms do increase binge eating, etc. Uh, does increase. In anorexia, uh, we see that some people deteriorate and um, lose weight, but some people become more resilient. So it seems a more of a mixed picture perhaps for anorexia, but 
probably the numbers in anorexia are less, but yes, it is worrying. And uh, as I say, uh, eating disorder service, services do feel as though we're under this deluge of a huge wave. The next question is just a practical one, but important. Could you share your PowerPoint after the session? So many references given would be interested to research it further. Would you like the person to write to you, email you? To yeah, I guess so. I, I, I think it's going to be, it's been recorded. Yes, yeah, so we haven't talked about that actually, but uh, yes, I don't mind that. Okay. I mean, I think some of the images, people were worried that I, I'd, the type you know we can't distribute outside because i've i've taken them from <laughs> different places hmm. okay next question thinking about your own long and distinguished career what is the piece of research i'm proud of and why well it's the, the one that's given me most joy has been the work with patients and carers um we, you know, we, we've been doing this for a long time and, and the partnership that we have and and the way that uh, they all they help us with with developing new ideas, thinking of better ways to implement it or take over supporting each other, you know, has been phenomenal. And I've been lucky enough to be able to write books with patients and carers uh, that sort of helpfully give information uh, which hopefully increases awareness and decreases the length of illness. The, the next one is a, is a slightly puzzling one. What are the underlying issues and reasons for different eating disorders and how to address them? This came very early on before you had a chance to, to explain some of the underlying uh, okay. Yes, well, as I say, I do think that there are, although there are similarities across eating disorders, there are differences. And uh, I didn't really go into the, the, the lovely work done by Jane Wardle, who did work at the Institute, who's died, and Claire Llewellyn, who've been looking at eating behaviour of twins and, and showing how much eating behaviours are genetically determined. So some people uh, sort of start off, uh, you know, with a more robust appetite and others are much more picky right from the word go. So, you know, I think there are th those sort of underlying traits do explain quite a bit. It is seven o'clock now, but we said we'll go over by a couple of minutes. OK. The next question, it's often said that underlying anorexia is an issue of control and food intake is the one aspect of life that one can control completely. Could the enigma of an increased sense of well-being in anorexia come from this impression of being in absolute control? Yes, well, I think you get this perfect storm of uh, somebody who, you know, has these obsessive, compulsive, perfectionistic traits, uh, uh, using those traits to be a perfect dieter. You know, there's persistence, there's um, perfectionism, uh, there's determination, uh, but they are all used in the service of the eating disorder. So. So I think that those traits, uh, perhaps if you lose, you know, get triggered, come into play, but the, you need to perhaps to have some weight loss and you perhaps need to have an underlying vulnerability as well. So it's, um, but it, but yes, that, that often is the case. And, uh, and for those with that disposition, it, it's very hard to give up that control. Thank you. Next question, as psilocybin treatments and trials have started to emerge with depression and other disorders, do you think there's a possible application for it with eating disorders? Well, yes, I think uh, at Imperial College, David Nutt is um, trying to get such a study underway. I mean, the, the amount of preparatory work for these studies is enormous, uh, you know, uh, any 
treatment study it takes a lot but one with a, a, a drug that you, you can't easily obtain is even harder and there are studies um, at Boston no not Boston um, John Hopkins already started on it so things are happening and ketamine as well there's a lot of interest in because of it treatment for depression and people are using it sort of off label well off label is but it you know you can diet so treat the comorbidity of depression perhaps with ketamine okay i'm going to go for one last question and and then the remaining questioners will have to email you about their questions mm -hmm. so this last question is the inpatient treatment for those with anorexia involves set meal times. In your experience, do individuals who have recovered need to adhere to timetables or are they able to be spontaneous with their food consumption? I think when we ask patients, they usually do say they have to have a ritual and a routine because it's so easy for them to skip a meal and not recognise it and then that get into a pattern. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think that we we would advise that. Yeah. Thank you. I think we will stop there. Otherwise, yeah. we'll exhaust our speaker. <laughs> um, there are a few more questions that are left. Would okay. the people who have asked those please email Janet? And my very final task is to thank Janet once again and to draw your attention to the next talk in this series on Monday the 30th of November at 6 with Professor Sir John Strang and the title is Preventing Heroin Overdose Deaths with Citizen Training and Take Home Naloxone. How Quentin Tarantino Helped Us Change Global Policy and Practice. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.